What's up guys, Javier from That Racing Channel. Welcome to our 2023 video series where we team up with Real Street Performance to bring you exclusive engine build content. You can look forward to Jay from Real Street Performance providing invaluable lessons throughout the series. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, join us on this exciting look into building engines with Jay from Real Street Performance. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today I'm here with Ricky from Shipping and we're gonna assemble his K20. What's going on guys? My name is Ricky. I work in the shipping department as head of receiving and my main role here at Real Street Performance is to verify all parts are correct, accurate, so as soon as I get to your door, whatever you order is there. Yep, so if you've ordered a package here from Real Street, chances are Ricky has touched your package and today we are going to assemble his boosted K20. So this setup was a stock K20A2, made over 400 horsepower. Um, one thing led to another though, and the piston ended up breaking. So that leads us to today. We have all the proper machine work done. We've got the block aligned honed. We've got the block boarded honed. We've decked the block. We've got a set of Wiseco flat top pistons. We got some upgraded pins, a set of BC H beam connecting rods. We've got a set of BC camshafts and a set of SuperTech valve springs. So we're gonna go ahead and put this thing back together. I've done all the measuring, all the cleaning. Uh, Ricky hasn't built engines before in the past, so we thought it would be a good idea to bring someone in and kind of watch the process, ask some questions, and hopefully make an informative video that you guys can take something away from. So I'm gonna start this process by getting the piston cooling jets or oil squirters back in the block. Once those are back in the block, we can move to installing the bearings, getting the crank in, the bed plate, remain seal, and then we can kinda move along to the engine stand work. Um, I do this part of the job with the engine laying on a table because these blocks don't have a ton of integrity. And if I put it on the engine stand, it's hanging off, you know, it's hanging weight off the back of the block. So I like to do uh, the work that I can do with the bed plate off with the block kind of in a natural or neutral position without any weight on it. I do however have a piece of cardboard on the bench because the deck of the block is extremely fragile to damage and you want to be sure that you don't nick or mark or scratch the deck of your engine block because you can um, unfortunately ruin the engine if you damage the deck because some of these dents that you can get in it you won't be able to take back out. So this main tunnel has a tolerance. It can't be too big, can't be too small. Same with the connecting rods. All the bearing housings need to be the exact size that the book calls for. Because if not, the bearings won't be retained well and they won't function properly. Now we're gonna use a uh, fairly thick assembly lube. And reason being is you won't prime this engine during, a, during cranking, during your first startup. So when you first start a new engine, there's not oil primed in the system. Old engines had a way to prime the oil externally through the use of like an oil pump drive shaft. Or if you have a dry sump engine, you can spool it up with a drill and get it lubricated. But with this, we're gonna use a thick assembly lube that's gonna stay put during the first startup because for a number of seconds, it won't have oil pressure. You'll just be relying on that assembly lube. So the assembly lube is quite a bit thicker than what you'd conventionally use for motor oil. You can drop that in place. wipe that whole flange down and make sure that it's totally dry and clean of oil because we don't want to have leaks where the case halves go together. Anytime I have an engine that I'm not familiar with, I'll go ahead and use a Sharpie and I'll just paint a super easy path like that. And that way when I have um, my time to apply the silicone, I know that I'm putting it in the right place. Right. I built these engines and I kind of know the path, but basically you're gonna scribble a line where it, the service manual says to have silicone and that way you don't mess up.
Now we are reusing the factory bolts and we need to lubricate the bolt. So we're gonna get lubrication on the face of the bolt head and on the face of the washer along with the threads. But what'll happen if you uh, install them without enough lubricant? Um, you won't get the right torque. Mm. You know, these are torque angles. So we're gonna go to 22 foot pounds and then out to 56 degrees. But um, if you have the threads dry, like they'll let you know it won't be, it won't feel good, it won't sound good, and it won't be good. So we're gonna evenly turn the bed plate down just a little bit at a time because we're trying to be careful to not cause a bunch of distortion on those dowels. And before we pull it down all the way, we're gonna make sure that our rain rain seal is still completely seated. Mm -hmm. So we've got our first round of bolts in. Now we can put the perimeter bolts around the bed plate. And these bolts just assist the, the bed plate? Yeah, to the, sit properly. the bed plate is kind of a girdle of sorts. Mm -hmm. You know, the, as these castings get lighter and lighter and lighter, you know, in the old days you had this cast iron block like a 2JZ and the, the things are pretty strong. And as you move into um, later model engines, especially the Hondas, they're fairly light castings, you know, and um, the bed plate design offers a lot of strength to the bottom of the engine block, you know. So whereas a B-series uh, pound for pound is still an incredible engine, you know, some would argue that the block is uh, stronger than a K-series block, especially without the bed plate. I mean, there's just not a lot of material in these K-blocks. And you see it when you machine on them. You know, when you machine on them, they, they move around and that's, you know, kind of a telltale sign of um, a lack of integrity, but whenever you put this bed plate on it, things strengthen up quite a bit. So you've got your main cap bolts and then you've got these perimeter bolts. Now, you can't take the bed plate off of another K and drop it onto this one, just like you wouldn't switch main caps around without machining. So if you do have a block that doesn't have a bed plate, just be mindful that there's, um, there's a lot of fitting involved before you can get that right. You know, don't just do that at home without a machine shop because you'll make a mess of it. That's good to know, actually. Now, if you look inside the engine block, you can see that silicone, how it's just squeezed out a little bit. Oh, yeah. That's an OEM silicone. That'll stay put for the life of the engine. So where that tube of silicone may be 40 bucks and the one at your average do-it-yourself so auto parts store is like eight bucks or whatever, like buy the good silicone because you don't, there's no excuse to have oil leaks on a modern Japanese engine. Old domestic engines, they're gonna leak a little bit of oil here and there because they have gasket systems that are rooted in the 50s and 60s. But this stuff's good, buy a good silicone, don't deal with leaks. So I'm ready to put the engine on the engine stand, but before I do that, I wanna put this main galley plug in. So I put a little bit of blue Loctite on the threads. All right, ready? Yep. Perfect. All right, now we can start to assemble some pistons and rods. Cool. But I've touched the engine stand. I've got some stuff on my hands I don't like. I'm gonna go wash my hands, then I'm gonna come back. And we're gonna go ahead and assemble pistons and rods, get rings on the pistons and move forward. So now I'm to the point where I need to get the pistons and the rods assembled. So this is the piston pin. This is a full floating design. So the rod is bushed, so the pin will slide through the rod and the piston is honed to size where the pin will slide through there. So you need to have retention clips and that's what these are. These clips go in each side of the piston in that little groove and hold the pin from falling out. In the past we'd have pistons returned and the um, person assembling them looked like they just got in a huge fight with these clips and there's scratches everywhere. So you wanna kind of be firm with your hand. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push that clip up in there. See that with the thumb? Yeah. So once I get it loaded up in there, I'm gonna grab this corner and I'm just gonna roll the pick 
and it's gonna pop down in that hole. And you just work it down in there until it clicks. Hmm. And now you can look at it and it's fully seated. But you wanna make sure that every one of them is fully seated. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna put half of those clips in now. And then when I uh, load the piston and pins together, I'll load the other half of the clips in. Wanna if I try it out? Sure. Cool. All right, so to stabilize the piston with your hand, right hand, use your thumb to load that clip up against the piston and then use your other hand to flip the clip in. You know, and I mainly did domestic engines. By the time I got to the seventh or eighth piston, my thumb tip would always be like, Oof. and I was like, well, I'm glad I'm not building 12 cylinders. Well, good thing I'm sticking to four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot better. Ouch. Uh-oh. I'm bleeding, Jay. Hmm. Let's call somebody. Pablo, come help. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, okay, yep. Jesus Let me see, Pablo. let me see. All right, we might have to amputate. Sit down. No, man. Sit down. Okay, get it. Right, hold Pablo, on. What did you do? You stabbed he's, yourself with a pit? We're going to have to get <laughs> I think so. Here. We might be able to save it. Saws off. We saw it off and then we oh, cut man. the propane torch. Off. Propane torch to sear it so, so it doesn't, it doesn't bleed keep everywhere. Bleeding. Well, you could just sear it now. Why don't we use that Subaru bond? All right, can you guys side. move this operation aside so I can keep working? What do you mean? We'll be fine. All right, come here, Rico. Let me bandage you up real quick. The worst thing about band-aids when you're trying to build an engine is you can no longer use your fingertips. So a lot of that stuff you got to kind of work through. And this, these picks are funny. Like you can poke your finger pretty good. And in the comments section, of course, because that's where things happen, there'll be someone that shows a link to a tool that you load this clip into and then you just like boop it right in the piston. They're really neat tools. They're uh, size specific, but I'm old school and I just do things the way that I do them. All right, well, I'm all patched up. All right, back on it. Back on it. So what makes these pistons um, more beneficial over a stock piston? Okay, that's a great question. So these pistons are made out of a 2618 alloy. They're a forged aluminum piston. And that alloy is a uh, much stronger alloy than the factory, um, you know, hyper eutectic or a cast piston material. And the downside to a 2618 piston is it requires more clearance. And a lot of what the OEMs did in the past 15 years or so to get away from a forged piston was in the realm of uh, oil control. So these pistons will grow more with heat. That's why they require more clearance. So this engine has three and a half thousandths of piston to wall clearance. That's because as the block heats up and the piston heats up, the piston's gonna grow more. If you put a 2618 piston in an engine with a factory clearance, you know, a clearance that could have been, you know, a thou or two, chances are you're going to seize the piston in the bore. So 2618 pistons are a lot stronger because they're um, a kind of a more pliable alloy that's gonna grow and, and take abuse better than a harder alloy that's gonna crack. Like when an OEM piston cracks, it generally cracks in the ring land. And these pistons um, will be a lot stronger for the abuse of a boosted engine. You know, but again, they you know used to have cars with um, factory forged pistons. And there's some alloys out there like the Dodge Hellcat has a, uh, a piston that's kind of a funny OEM level alloy and they deal well with boosted applications. But in the aftermarket, you basically, um, you can get a low expansion, like a 4032, like a Supertech piston, mm -hmm. like I have in my B series. Um, or you can go move to a 2618. If you have a boosted engine, you just buy a 2618. It's just a much stronger part because you're gonna mess up. You know, like when you had this engine in your car before and you were just getting it sorted, there were some fuel delivery issues with um, how the basket interacted with the fuel pump and with the fuel level and the engine was run low on fuel a couple times. Like things like that, a uh, 2618 piston is more likely to let you get away with. Mm -hmm. Whereas a uh, OEM piston is more prone to, to, to cracking. Right. You know? So this is just a stronger forging. Now these forgings, uh, the Wiseco line does offer a good amount of options for a, a very affordable part. So you have 
an accumulation ring. You've got these anti-detonation grooves, which they think are going to equalize the pressure as the pressure comes down around the piston. Um, it's a pretty uh, dressed up piston for um, a very good value. So I know this is a rod and this is the rod cap. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how do you know which rod cap goes where? Oh, that's a good question. So different manufacturers will have a, um, a laser etched number in the rod that um, kind of marry it or associate it with their partner cap. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this particular rod, there's a number and this number is on one of these three rods. Okay. Now what I do because it's an old habit is I get a engraving tool out and I put a number on the rod and on the cap before I take them apart because I don't want to risk mixing things up. If you mix the components up, um, you could have a rod that if it does allow you to have the engine rotate, you know, if you bolt the wrong rod to the wrong cap and you've mixed things up, the engine may rotate. If it doesn't rotate, you're lucky because you know something's wrong and you got to stop. But if it does rotate and you put it together, chances are it's going to live for a very short period of time. So each rod is sized with a partner cap. So uh, how did you get started with um, building engines? Uh, well, I think that from the time I was a small child, I was pretty infatuated with cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was kind of a truck driver turned landscaper turned tree service guy. And um, there were trucks that needed to be worked on. And um, one of the things he probably wasn't real good at is picking the right guy for the job. It was more of uh, looking around and saying, can, can, well, can we save money by having that guy do that? And a lot of times I was that guy. So I started working on the trucks doing, you know, basic things, oil changes, spark plugs. Uh, and then that kind of gave way to a head gasket job, or there was one big truck that I did an in-frame on. Um, and it just continued to grow in interest. And then once I became uh, driving age, um, you know, I, I clearly, I wanted a hot rod. So I ditched the little cars that I was into up to that point and uh, got a little Mustang and then that needed an engine rebuild and, you know, just, it kept progressing. But I think it's more of a obsession. We have what I believe to be um, a very high value tool in this ring compressor. So this ring compressor is gonna allow you to load the rings into the cylinder without damage. But in order to do that, you need to, um, you need to make sure that you are using the right speed because you have to pass this um, ring package past this edge. So if I take this tool and I do it very slowly where I drop the piston in, I have the tool flat on the deck mm -hmm. and I push real slow, it's gonna stick. As soon as that ring comes out of the tool, it goes bink and now it's stuck. And the worst thing I can do is force it. So I'm now stuck. So I need to pull this back out. You can see it came right out of the bottom of the thing. Yep. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply more of what I would call like a loading speed. So you get the piston at the bottom of the tool. You put the ring compressor flat on the deck. You take your thumbs, just boop, just like that. You wanna go fast because you're passing that through and as you pass it through, you don't want it to bridge that small gap and stick again. Hmm. So. It's not, a, it's not a game of force, it's just a game of speed. Would you like to load a piston in? Sure. Okay. So which way does this piston have to face before okay. you put it in? So these pistons have offset pins. So you may not be able to see it with your eye, but the pin is a little bit more one way than the other. And that just helps in avoiding scuffing and a quieter operation. Mm -hmm. If you had four of the same valve reliefs, the piston manufacturer will generally put a dot, the dot faces forward. 
If you have no valve relief, same thing, you normally get a dot. There are some pistons that aren't labeled and you have to do some measuring and be careful to make sure they're facing the right way. But in this case, it's easy. Your intake valves are bigger than your exhaust valves. Mm -hmm. The intake is on one side of the engine, the exhaust is on the other. That's how you're gonna load the piston in there. So you're gonna face the piston to where the intake side of the piston is where the intake manifold of the engine is gonna be. So drop it down into the bore slowly, carefully. Now, seat the ring compressor up against the deck and right. then look at your alignment. Look at how your valve release are facing. So you see it needs to turn clockwise a yep. little bit. Okay, now rest your hands on the ring compressor and use your thumbs and give it a boop, even with the bad thumb. All right, that's good. All right, nice. Cool. Then you can kind of fish your free hand down here and um, as you work the rod and piston down the bore, just line it onto the crank journal. All right, now we can flip the engine over and put our caps on those two rods. Ooh. We're gonna put some assembly lube on the bearing face. We're gonna make sure that our tang is lined up with our other tang. Okay. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna have a mess on your hands. And then we need to get some rod bolts lubricated. You wanna use the lubricant that the manufacturer suggests for the bolt and you wanna torque the bolt to the spec the manufacturer gives you. Okay. Get our little brush and get our rod bolts. Squeeze a little bit of this onto the table. Get it on the brush. Listen to Bob Ross in your head. Paint the bolt threads. Who's Bob Ross? Who's <laughs> Bob Ross? You hear that kids? <laughs> Who's Bob Ross? Oh, man. man. You are missing out on life if you don't know who Bob Ross is. Oh man. Yeah. Who's Bob Ross? Did I insult you? Not just me. <laughs> Not just me. Oh man. My daughter knows who Bob Ross is. So these bolts, again, just like the bed plate, there's a dowel. Mm -hmm. You wanna tighten the bolt up evenly to seat the cap on the rod. You don't wanna tighten one bolt down all the way and then tighten the other bolt down because you're gonna deform the dowel. And when I tighten the bolts, I'm going to um, go ahead and do it in two steps. The first step is a very low torque, like 10 foot pounds. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is the target. There's a lot of things that go into tightening a bolt and you don't wanna deal with, um, say the bolt torque goes to 45 foot pounds. If I do this in small increments and let's say I end up at 35 and then I wanna go to 45, the amount of torque it takes to break the fastener loose to rotate again is, um, is either too close or over the target itself. So we're gonna seat the caps at 10 foot pounds. And then we're gonna go right to our torque. So I've got my foot on the engine stand. I'm gonna drop a pin in here so the engine doesn't rotate. And then I'm going to pull this in one motion to the torque spec.
When was the first time you put your own model together? Well, I think that first in frame came around um, 15. Mm -hmm. And then I bought a Mustang and uh, the dude that I bought it from, he had filled the engine with uh, smokeless oil. It's like vegetable oil. What? So I go to drive the car, car doesn't smoke. I'm happy doing burnouts, smiling, not a care in the world. First thing I do, go home, change the oil in my new car. That thing started smoking like crazy. Wow. Yeah. So I, uh, I had to face the music pretty shortly after that and uh, pulled the engine out and um, had it machined and got some forged pistons and uh, a camshaft and, you know, it's ready to take over the world. I did, I did take it to the track though before I pulled the engine out. Did you? It went 15.5 at 88. Wow. It was heartbreaking. <clears throat> All right, we are ready for a cylinder head. Cool. We are going to move all of the pistons down away from the deck. Mm -hmm. Now, on this engine, um, because when you put the cylinder head on, there are no rocker arms, you can't run the valves into the pistons right now. But on some engines, you could. So I think anyone that is uh, doing this work benefits from just moving the crankshaft to a position that the pistons are down. Can't hit anything. Right. Before we put the head gasket on, we've got a comedic head gasket for it. We're gonna go ahead and make sure that the deck is dry. So there's some assembly lube that has now migrated a little bit around the bores. See this oil? Yep, I see it. Yep, you just wanna get all that off and make sure the deck is dry before you put the gasket on. <clears throat> Now you need your dowels. Anytime a component has a dowel, you want to use a dowel. This is going to align the component. So you have a head gasket. <clears throat> the head gasket goes on the dowels and is now located. Before we go much further, we're going to get our ARP head stud kit. And you are going to think about how many hours of enjoyment you have ahead of you while watching Bob Ross. Some springs or retainers, they say 80 pounds, 90 pounds, sure. 105 pounds. Yep. What do those numbers mean actually? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, the, that's the pressure at the installed height. The distance from the bottom of the retainer to the top of the spring cup mm -hmm. is, a, is a measurable distance that during the setup of the cylinder head, you define that distance. And if you need to alter that distance, you can do it through changing shims. You can do it through changing locks. You can do it through changing retainers. You can move that spring around a little bit. You want that installed height, that 90 or 100, that first number that you gave, that's how many pounds of pressure are on the spring right now mm -hmm. at the installed height. Right. So as you go up in valve spring, you know, you may uh, alleviate yourself from valve float as you go up in spring, but you basically want the least amount of spring it takes to not have valve float. Valve float is when the valve train loses control. And when the valve train loses control, a lot of things go wrong. You could have valve to valve contact. You could have valve to piston contact. You can have um, rocker arms break. I mean, everything breaks, but you don't wanna just buy the most amount of spring available because you'll tear something else up. As we move forward, we will be doing more, um, more stuff with valve springs. Mm -hmm to try to educate things like installed height and open pressure and whatnot. But, um, you know, the, these quality manufacturers 
um, SuperTac, Brian Crower, like they've really done a really good job of taking a lot of that work out of your hands mm. and just giving you a quality product to work with. Mm. So we've got the cylinder head on. Let's go ahead and start addressing the rest of this build. So a lot of progress. Now there's a bunch of small parts that need to go onto the engine. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start with stalling the oil pump. On this engine it is chain driven. So we're gonna drop that guy in place and then we need to uh, install its little idler feature. Now that we've got the oil pump on, we can put the timing chain on. There's a black keyway here, and two black keyways here. These are gonna be your cams, this is gonna be your crank. And if you look at the sprocket, you see that line? Right there? Yep. So you're just gonna drop this in line with that mark. And then we've got this little drag cartel guide here, which we can kinda hold the chain in place because we're gonna flip the engine back over. Before we install the cam tower, we need to put the lost motion springs in, which are these fellows. And these just drop in and they stabilize the uh, VTEC rocker when VTEC is not in use. And because you can see that that component interacts with another component in motion, because there's wear there, we're just gonna put a little lubrication. When you're at this point, stop, because it's possible that weeks or months have gone by and you haven't touched this assembly. Mm -hmm. So getting a visual on all of the rocker pins is a real smart idea because you want to come back to this. All right, let's get some camshafts. What do we cool. got? What do we got? Looks like we got some Brian Crower. Yep. Stage dose. Since it's a roller cam and not a flat tappet cam like a 2J where you have buckets, you have very low liability of wiping the cam lobe out, but you're still gonna lubricate everything. These uh, cam caps are all labeled too, so they have a, a home. Are they? You know, one, two, three, four, five, see the big number? Oh, nice, okay. So you don't, uh, and they also have an arrow, you know, which way they face. So what's the uh, reason behind choosing aftermarket cams over stock cams? Uh, cause you're going to get more lift and duration. Mm -hmm. The lift is how far the valve opens and the duration is how long the valve is open for. So those two kind of travel hand in hand. There's rules to the game where you can't open and close a valve with, um, with valve springs, you know, like formula one, like anything pneumatic, that's a different thing. But when you're mechanically opening and closing valves, there's rates of acceleration and limitations to the components that have to be respected. So you can't, um, you can't just add a bunch of lift without adding some amount of duration. And you can't add um, 
a certain amount of duration without adding a bunch of, uh, without adding a certain amount of lift. They, they travel hand in hand mm -hmm. and you want to open the valve um, as fast as you can, as far as you can, and as long as you can respectful to the um, engine speed operation. Like when you hear camshafts that are like rough at idle, right. you're listening to the overlap. You're listening to the um, intake valve and exhaust valve are basically open for some period at the same time and air is passing through the engine. And that's how you get that chop. Now you guys, unless you have um, the VTEC deleted, you don't really have to deal with that. No. That's why if you, you, cause you get the best of both worlds, you're going to drive around on the small lobe. It's going to have a good low speed pumping character. And then whenever you go to high engine speed, you go to the high speed lobe and you have, um, lift and duration that works well with this, uh, incredible cylinder head to make a ton of power. We can get the chain on now. So we've got a idler guide, a guy that doesn't move. That's this guy. And then we have an idler that's on a pin that's gonna be actuated by your tensioner. So we can string this stuff up and fish the chain on. And we're gonna look for those two black keyways to align those with the uh, marks on the camshaft sprockets. So if you look at your timing chain, you'll see that now all those marks are lined up. So you have your black keyway, mm -hmm. black keyway, the arrow on the, on the nose of the block and the arrow on the crank sprocket, all that stuff's lined up. That's how you know it's timed right. Now, when we go to put the timing cover on, mm -hmm. it's your last chance to look at this part of the engine. So you ask yourself like, did I tighten everything? Mm -hmm. And it's okay to just double check. So what we're gonna do right now, because we're talking, we're gonna just check all the bolts because we don't need to go back in here and we don't need something to come off. So spend a minute. Just check. Tighten this bolt that I warned you about earlier. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about that bolt, guys. The date. The date? Yeah, the date. We're at anywhere. There you go. All right. It's gonna be fine. It's good. Looks it's like good. me. It likes it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, pan on. We got these alignment dowels. <clears throat> cool. So in order to not smear the silicone everywhere when we're dropping the pan on, Mm -hmm. We're going to find the dowel. So you're going to find that corner. 
and I'm gonna find this corner and we're gonna look way over manpowered to install an oil pan. Bam. Cool? Cool. Dowels are uh, really neat. Is that fun? Hey, you wanna give it a spin? Oh yeah, why not? Test drive? Test drive, man. Can't spin it as fast as him, but you know. What's the trick to spinning it fast? It's all on the wrist, man. Is it? Yep. I don't got that flick? Nope, you don't got that flick. Oh man. You don't have those mechanic fingers. You've seen the memes. <laughs> Bigger sweeps, that way you don't creep up on it. So that? Quick. Yeah. What What do you think was the most interesting part? Do you look at it a little bit differently now that you've seen inside uh, and all the components and how they um, how they go together? I think it's all interesting to be honest. I mean, it's, it's one thing to get hands on with these parts um, on a daily basis when they come in, but I think it's a different um, Type of feel when you actually get to see how every part interacts with each other yep. when it comes to being put together so i learned a lot today i mean i, yeah, I learned a cool. lot so. very cool yeah, yeah it's neat because you're um you you've only been doing this for a few years so you're not mm -hmm. one of the guys that um was incorrectly trained for a long period of time and is set right. in his ways so you could say like well you do it this way because it because that's what I was told to do it. Mm -hmm. And that affects a lot of how we approach problems. So getting some uh, good mentoring right out of the gate is a good position to be. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that too. Yeah. All right, so our next move is to adjust the valve lash, but first we need to put the damper back on. This keyway is what's gonna keep the crankshaft damper and the crankshaft in alignment, so the numbers are meaning something. Mm -hmm. So there's timing marks on the balancer, and we're gonna make sure that they stay straight by using the keyway to make sure all that stuff's in alignment. So if you look at the balancer, TDC is lined up with a timing pointer and your cam marks are still vertical. And these lobes are both away from the roller rockers and you have play here, hear this? Yeah. Okay, that's the distance between the valve adjuster and the valve tip. If that distance is too big, it's gonna hammer that valve tip and it's gonna mushroom the top of the valve over, it's gonna be a mess. So we need to make sure that the valve lash is correct. So we're gonna check that using feeler gauges. And we're gonna check the valve lash in the firing order. Mm -hmm. Because if we do number one TDC, and then we look at number three, bring it to TDC, the lobes are gonna be in the right spot. Then number four, then number two, one, three, four, two. So we're gonna check all of our intake and exhaust valve lash and make sure all that's within spec. And then we can go ahead and put the cam cover on and I can give this thing back to you. Cool.
You ready to take this thing home? Absolutely, I am. All right. When you were putting the rest of the components on the engine, the intake manifold, for example, mm -hmm. like look inside of it, shake it around, make sure that you don't put anything foreign in the engine mm -hmm. when you're installing it because that happens to people. And then get some thin oil in it, like 520, get it fired up, mm -hmm. run it for like 15 minutes, like 1500 to 2000 RPM, dump the oil out of it. Mm -hmm. Put another oil change into it and then uh, drive it, if it were mine, I would drive it like a civilized person mm -hmm. with like some respect to all these new components and just put 100 miles on it and then do whatever you want. Okay. Okay. And the engine weight is 5 to 820? That's what you're going to start with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want thin oil to get in all the places right away. Mm -hmm. um, and this engine doesn't have very loose clearances, so that will be fine. And then we'll move to... Um, Plus for in the winter, so maybe winter, summertime we may have a 1540 in it, mm -hmm. but for right now you can run like a 520 for the break-in. Okay? Cool. Good Thanks, luck. Jay. Yes, sir. I'm excited for you. Me too. I hope you've enjoyed this video, a bit of a conversation piece while we build an engine for a guy that's uh, very important to us here at Real Street, so I hope he has a lot of fun with it, and um, if he tears it up, we'll do it all again.